Good to be together. Boy, has it been a strange season. And uh, good to see your faces. I, uh, today, um, <laughs> obviously thinking a lot about this and just excited to zero in together today on something about Jesus that I think is something we can not only hold on to, but we can turn into worship and into prayer. It's always my heart as a pastor that we wouldn't just talk about following Jesus, talk about the scriptures and the Bible and talk about what spiritual things look like, but that we would actually take his words and put them into practice, right? And the theme today is from Colossians 1. We're going to spend a couple weeks here on this theme in particular, but it's the phrase from verse 17 that says, in him all things hold together. In him all things hold together. Can you just say that with me? In him all things hold together. Such a powerful statement. Next week we're going to look at we're going to go a little further into what does that mean when everything else is falling apart? <laughs> That'll be next week. Um, but I want to look at this today in terms of just letting it reframe our perspective of who Jesus is. If you have a Bible or you're reading your Bible on your phone, uh, turn to Colossians chapter one. And those of you who um, are still just watching online, know that we're praying for you. And actually at the beginning of the message as we've been encouraging you, take, take a moment and text somebody that you know, just send them a quick text and say, hey, praying for you today, thinking about you today. Maybe somebody that you've been to worship service with that you're not with this morning. Just take a moment and, but just don't get into a texting thread for the rest of the message. That's my only request. So, and get some bread and some wine or juice ready for communion, which we'll have at the end uh, after the message. I uh, was very encouraged by the things shared in the Daniel series on faithfulness and Jay Pathak for coming and helping, um, being faithful in a politically complex time. Interesting as I've reviewed not only the last six months, but the last even beyond a year before the pandemic, we actually did a series on the connected life. Remember that? <laughs> how we share life together, how the reality is that church is not a building, but it's people. It's the gathered community is literally what the word for church in the Bible means, the gathered community. We talked, we spent time on building bridges, on reimagining diversity. We did a series on faith and on fractured, being fractured and how God brings healing. Now that many things have been coming apart in our society, not only that, pandemic fatigue has set in, I think. How many of you are experiencing pandemic fatigue? How many of you don't know exactly what that is, but you'd say, yeah, but I think I got that. <clears throat> We want to look beyond ourselves and find hope and restoration of our souls. And I can't think of a better way to do that than to make much of Jesus, than to worship Jesus, to exalt him and allow his life to continue to transform us and change us. Do you realize that as a follower of Jesus, there's, there's a way that God has set out for you a prescription, if you will, for your soul to be restored. And that happens every time you connect with him in worship and exalting him, declaring, living into who he really is and who he says he is. There's something that happens in that to where when you say certain things about Jesus, they become more than just words. They become something from your heart and your mind and your body that you're declaring and something happens to bring life when we do that. I keep coming back to this, the greatest way to please God and live in a place of peace is to make much of Jesus, to be shaped by the dynamic, this connected life 
with the Son of God. So in him, all things hold together. So we're going to start in Colossians chapter 1 at verse 9. And I want you to think as I read these verses today, I'm actually going to read the middle section together out loud, but as I read these verses today, I want you to think about where we sit right now. Because the church in Colossa and all that was going on at the time, there was a lot of conflict in the world. There was a lot of upheaval. Um, Jews had been scattered all over. There was tremendous persecution for faith. There was suffering. Christians were being killed for being followers of Jesus. I mean, it was really serious stuff. And a lot of times we don't identify that with that until we go through hardship, right, or suffering. And so when you think about where we sit right now, maybe the words will take on new meaning. That's my hope and that's my prayer. And, all, and this is what's been happening to me as I've been reading this. So let's pray and then we'll jump in. Lord, we thank you for the power of your word to change us and transform us and to bring life. Would you do that today? Would you speak through your word? In Jesus' name. Amen. So he says, this is the Apostle Paul writing in verse 9, And so from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. How many of you want to be filled with the knowledge of his will? How many of you would like to go, man, I'd like to know the will of God, especially these next few weeks. I'd like to know what God's will is. Interesting, the word knowledge here, uh, this one and then the next usage of this word is, it's not just a head knowledge, it's an experiential knowledge and it's got a, the, the way the word's formed in the original language, it's got an intensity to it. It's an experiential knowledge of his will. That's what he wants you to have. Not just checking boxes and going, tell me what to do so I make sure and don't make a mistake. It's like, no, he wants you to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Can you just say that with me? Increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. That's good news. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now he's going to say, this is one of the most powerful sections, I think, in all of the Bible. He's going to say things about Jesus. And these are things that, man, he wants them to, this is what it means to increase in the knowledge of who God is and the knowledge of his will. And so I'm gonna ask you to read these with me. Uh, can we put the first part of that up? Okay, here we go. Out loud together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Let's pause there just for a moment. I wanna invite all of you, even if you're watching online at home, I want you to say these words out loud. I don't know about you, but I've noticed this when I watch and involved in watching worship stuff online. It's really easy to be kind of passive and quiet, but sometimes I find myself speaking out and singing out and all of that, and something different happens when you engage with God's word, right? And so, and all of you in the room, I encourage you, let's go up just to, from about a three to a five. <laughs> thank you. Oh, I heard that. Who are you calling three? I heard that. Thank you. God bless you. Okay. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, 
He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Wow, that is so, so good. He goes on to say, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he's now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in faith, the faith stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So he says, in him, all things hold together. The word for holding together there, sonestano in the Greek, is is a word that was actually used in Greek literature to, uh, as a picture of a vessel that would hold water. That's why this is up here today, just to remind you. It was, it, and it's being used here in the scripture as a picture of how God holds everything together. Unlike this imperfect vessel, he's perfect. But it's, you imagine when you're pouring water into something, you want it to not have holes in it, right? And God himself holds everything together. I love this picture. I mean, most of the commentaries on these verses and on this verse in particular talk about how, how God holds and sustains all things. One translation is all things cohere. Most talk about uh, even how scientists, when they look at the atom, they, they've given this phrase to what they call the strong force, which is a mystery, even to scientists, how the inner workings of the atom are held together. A mystery and how the basic building block of all of the whole universe, how God holds everything together. I don't understand that. But there's so many beautiful promises, so many things that we look to. And when we look at this, I mean, how can, I look at a phrase like this, in him all things hold together and I just go, what does this look like for me and for us in following Jesus even in this season? What does it look like for us to have our perspective shaped so that we're living as people who believe that in him all things hold together? So that when we look around this room, some have lost loved ones. We look around this room and we know that people that have lost coworkers, people have lost friendships, people have been through hardship, people are going through suffering, all sorts of stuff is going on. And we're not the ones who were supposed to be pridefully arrogant and triumphalistic in the way that we're talking about things, but there is something of faith that God wants us to have that in him all things hold together. And not only that, as a follower of Jesus, not only do all things hold together in him, but he holds you. Now, when we partake of communion, which we'll do in a little bit, these elements remind us that he holds all things together. You can partake of communion as some sort of ritual and just kind of go, ah, the bread, that was kind of stale juice thing, hardly anything. And just be thinking about the natural things that we would think about. Or you can open your heart when you receive communion and hear the words of Jesus that he says, you know what? Everything that I did on the cross, I did for you. This is my body broken for you. The only way you can enjoy the truth and rejoice in the truth that Jesus has come to set you free is when you open your heart to receive him. And I'm not talking about just one time. All the time. Every time we have communion. Have you ever noticed that about prayer that you can open your heart in that moment 
when you're praying, or you can just kind of be going through the motions. How many of you have found yourself praying about something, you got done praying, and you kind of went, oh, uh, what, what, what did I just do? I forgot even what I was just praying about. Just uh, this, actually just a few days ago, I, um, I was reading through this one app on my phone and it was a thing that, different articles, and I came across this article of 11 prayer tips from the life of Teresa of Avila. And I've read about Teresa of Avila. She's like one of my heroes when it comes to prayer. I mean, I just, just some amazing things about her, but one of them just jumped out at me. And, and this one tip, and she, she said this, 50 times a day, fervently and with desire, give yourself to him. 50 times a day, fervently and with desire, give yourself to him. And I thought, you know what? I've done a lot of different things in prayer. I've done a lot of different practices in prayer, but it just, it always helps to kind of have it reframed and see when, and so I started, this was on Thursday. So I started the rest of the day. I was just gonna try that, Lord remind me. And so when I would do that, I would just kind of pause no matter what was going on and just, um, and you can do that if you're even around people, you're not gonna make a bunch of noise and stuff. But just was going, Lord, I give myself to you. And then I thought about the fervently and with desire part. And I was like, okay, Lord, I really do give myself to you. And on Thursday, I did like, it was maybe 15 times. I got to the end of the day and I was like, 50, seriously? How many of you have gone through like half the day and gone, Lord, I'm sorry, I forgot you were around. <laughs> you know? But it's just such a beautiful practice. And then the last couple of days, it's increased. But it's just, it's just, again, one of those things, one of those reminders. I say this to you, understand, you know the reason why I share examples with you like that? It's, I don't do them really well. And I'm not sharing them to say, oh, look at me or anything like that. I'm sharing them because I'm challenging you. If you don't put your faith into practice, it's not working. Worship services on a weekend, for some people, it's like I go to the swimming pool once a week. I get in the water and then I try to stay a little bit wet the rest of the week, meaning I try to stay in God's presence the rest of the week, but that's it. And so during the pandemic, all of those things have been stripped away, right? And so what you do in the secret place is what comes out. It's what you live by. What is your daily bread? And you may go, you know what? I've never been reading. I've not been reading the Bible much. I mean, we all have so many things going on and so much stimulation, social media just bombarded constantly, right? I was praying about this and thinking about how in him all, all things hold together and thinking about just my own prayer life and thinking about God, I, I wanna just learn new ways of communicating with you and praying like Jesus prayed. And I was just asking the Lord, just bring to mind just something that would help me in this. And you know, the thought came back to me when I was in, when I was in high school, which was a few years ago, Wow, feedback on that one. My best friend, uh, Mark Palmer, I used to go over to Mark's house. We did a lot of stuff together, played golf together, hung out together, had fun together and all that. But we loved to listen to music together. And I would go over to his house and go into his room in his house. He would close the door and he would get out a record, LP, you know what I'm talking about? And put it on the record player, had these big speakers in his room, and we would listen to music for one to two hours. We would listen to an album all the way through. And sometimes not even talk. Well, we didn't talk much because you couldn't hear each other. It was so loud. And I was thinking about that and thinking about the practice of just not, and nowadays it'd be like we'd be listening to music and be on my phone and doing about five other things, right? And it was like the, the Lord was just reminding me of that time. And that coupled with also this week, I went out and we have some scrub oak in our yard. 
and I've been, this has been bothering me for a while. How many of you things bother you during the pandemic that didn't bother you before? You look at something and you go, I've been seeing that every day. That's driving me crazy. And the scrub oak has all these dead limbs on it and then limbs that are alive. And I just thought, well, I should prune that. And I told my wife, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna prune off those dead branches on there. And she looked at me with that look like, uh, what do you really mean by that? And how much pruning are you gonna do? You're not gonna be killing live stuff. And, you know, I read into things when your wife gives you that look. Did you explain that to me? And so I, so I went out and I just started, I just started pruning off all the dead branches. And the thought just hit me. Just like making space and cutting away distractions in our lives, I'm telling you, I think one thing Jesus is doing in this season is he's coming in and he's pruning away things that need to be taken off. He's coming in and he's going, that's, that's dead. And you go, ouch. <laughs> Not so dead. Right? Things within us. Practices. And I, I share those examples with you. Hopefully something will catch and just going, what is Jesus doing in my life right now? It says in John 15, I am the true grapevine. My father's the gardener. God's your gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they'll produce even more. There's a reason why there's pruning. It's so we would be more fruitful. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. In him, all things hold together. What have you found in your life that's helpful during this time? What have you found in your life that's a helpful practice? What have you found in your life that is, I mean, how are you responding to the kind of pruning that's going on? Maybe it's the daily prayer guide or daily Bible reading. I want to encourage you in these next couple weeks to spend time in Colossians 1 and just read through this and read it out loud. And read it as though you're saying this to him. And then if you don't understand what one of the verses means, look it up and see what other people say about it and pray about it. And then I just, I want to conclude with this. So one of the things I think that happens when pruning's happening, when God's at work in our lives, when things are being kind of stripped away and we're just left with whatever's left deep within is that it can be quite disorienting. And one of the things that can kind of spring up in our lives is doubt and skepticism as it relates to God. And so as I was reading this, in him all things hold together, I was just thinking about it. So what, so what is it about this phrase, in him all things hold together, what is it about this that I need, that we need together, that what is it about this that we're, when doubt comes in and I start to think, I don't know that he's holding all things together right now. Well, number one, you have to be honest with that. That's why the Psalms I find so helpful because I go back into the Psalms and they speak those things. There's a raw, honest courage in the Psalms that I think is so helpful. And it always turns then to worship, but it's, there's honesty. But I was thinking about this whole thing about doubt and about how, you know, uh, how it's easy to fall prey to deism and a deistic way of viewing things. And that's basically the belief that God's kind of like the grand watchmaker and he created everything and he set it all in motion and then he stepped back to watch and he's not involved. Many people who call themselves follower of, followers of Jesus are actually practicing deists meaning they believe that Jesus is who he says he is, but then they step back and go, you know, but he's not really involved in what's going on. And there's this battle. How many of you know the battle I'm talking about? And it's like, you know what? If God is really God, then why are things happening the way they are? And there's this blueprint mentality that it's like, well, it's all kind of laid out anyway, and we just, we can't impact it, and it's just gonna happen. 
And there's all sorts of doubt and unbelief that can come in. And I was wrestling through this and praying about it and thinking about it and thinking about all of creation. And then I came across this from G.K. Chesterton, just one of the greatest minds, philosopher, writer, author, guy from England. And, And he said this in his book, Orthodoxy. This is so beautiful. Listen to this. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. I don't know about you, but for me, that makes me want to worship. That makes me want to give thanks. That makes me go, you know what? God is not the author of evil. His heart is broken. He's grieved at suffering and evil. The cross is the only thing that really speaks rightly to it. But no matter where you are, I would challenge you today, open your heart to receive Jesus and to receive him as the scriptures declare who he really is. In him, all things hold together. What if God hasn't directed the sufferings that have gone on in your life, but what if he is working them together for good? What if what the enemy intended for evil, God is going to work for good? What if the very thing that has caused you to feel like, man, I'm one step forward and 10 steps back. What if God's saying, I'm actually strengthening you so that you're going to be able to climb a hill that nobody else has been able to climb? What if all of the weird, crazy stuff that's come at you has been something God has actually not orchestrated, but he's using in your life to teach you how to discern and how to be strong and how to learn and declare with other followers of Jesus that in him, all things hold together. Would you let him like rivet that into your heart and mind? By rivet, I don't mean literally that would bring up images of a lot of pain. But I mean, really drive it home into your heart and mind. In him, all things work together. Let's pray. Lord, today, we're so thankful for the power of your word and Jesus that you hold all things together. And Lord, we just ask that you would, uh, I ask Lord for a gift of faith that you would give to all those who are here and all those who are watching. Lord, would you also cause us, Lord, to find those ways of engaging with you and Lord, whether there's pruning happening or so much distraction and noise, would you just bring us into that space where we can be responsive to your Holy Spirit, responsive to your leading. Now, just, I'm just take, a, take a moment right now before we go into communion. Just take a moment right now and just pause and just listen for a moment. What is the invitation of Jesus to you right now? Just ask him, Lord, what are you inviting me into? What is it that you're speaking that supersedes all the stuff that's facing me right now? What is your calling on my life? Would you just ask him? I just have the sense, even in praying that right now, that Jesus right now, he's calling specific ones of you. He's reinforcing that. He's reminding you of how he's called you, how you belong to him. And Lord, for those who have suffered loss, Would you come and be with them and strengthen them? Thank you, Lord. And if you're in that space today, if God's highlighting something to you, how do you know that? Even just hearing us talk about Jesus, hearing me talk about Jesus, 
something just kind of, a thought just kind of hits you and you just feel kind of a drawing or an invitation or a, a, a longing, a desire in your own heart to really be more connected with Jesus and to have that kind of settled faith and peace that he wants to give. If that's you, just, just say this, just pray. Just let's start out together, say, Lord, help. Just whisper that prayer now, Lord, help me. Have mercy on me. I receive you. Come and sort me out and sort out what's going on around me. In Jesus' name, amen.